see more serious political conversations starting to happen. I want corporations out of the government and I want people back in. I want peace rather than militarization. I want the top wealthiest Americans to be taxed higher and that money to go to education. I want economic justice. I want to be able to speak my voice without jeopardizing my job. I want a greater regulation of the banks and the markets. I want my kids to have a job and health care. I want true democracy for the 99% of us who don't have it anymore. Hello and welcome to News Click. Today we have with us Professor Bernadine Dorn, who has been an activist in the 60s, a very well-known well known one, and now will be discussing with us on the question of the Occupy Wall Street movement. Bernadine, good to see you again. Pleasure to see you again. This is, after a long time, a movement in the United States that we haven't seen. Now, would you say that after 60s, this is the really the start of a new movement? Or would you say that there have been promises earlier? And this one, hopefully, is another one of them which will not fade out, like for instance, the anti-war or the anti-occupation thing in Iraq really fizzled out. Well, I see it a little bit differently. I think this is something very fresh and new and vibrant and juicy and exciting. And we can come back to that in a minute. But you wouldn't want to know, you wouldn't want to forget how much organizing and agitation and activism is ongoing here. I'll, I'll give you an example, the immigrant rights movement. Um, I wouldn't say it faded out. I think it exploded on the scene six or seven years ago and is now taking many different forms. Um, the same is true of, you know, labor and resistance. So I think there's a, a great deal of organizing and activism. I'll give you another example of uh, demonstrations in Washington, D.C., right before Occupy Wall Street started uh, opposing the tar sands project, resulting in a thousand arrests over a series of days. So this is... Um, a great, as you know, all open agitation that lights up the truth suddenly comes from a lot of organizing work, and that is ongoing. You know, we have had earlier agitations which are sort of issue-based. They focus on one issue or the other. This is the one which sort of seems to take on a much larger agenda. And that is what, in, in that sense, I see a resonance to the 60s, which was Maybe Vietnam was the trigger, but really took on a whole range of issues. Exactly. And I think that by creating a very big tent here, the, the issue of the 99%, we are the 99%, and this is what democracy looks like, they have uh, embodied, potentially, all social justice activism and radical thinking that's going on by pointing at what capitalism is doing at this historical moment. And so it, it contains within it, obviously right now, multiple ideologies and multiple um, uh, participants, but it has that, that clarity uh, of looking at the moment that we're in and the immiseration of more and more people in the United States. Uh, it, it's very exciting tactically, as well as um, its ability to be replicated. In that sense, it does remind you of, of you know, burning draft cards, of the sit-in movements of the early 60s, of that ability for people to, uh, an open door sense of the movement. Now, it's not hard to find, it's not hard to get to. You can go look, you can bring your children. There's old people, there's young people. Um, the evictions, the foreclosures, the lack of jobs, the indebtedness of everybody, and the bailouts of the extraordinarily rich. That's the essence of the, the truth that they're illuminating, and, and uh, it's very exciting to be there. I've been in both New York and Chicago occupations, and they're quite different, and yet they each have this kind of uh, vibrancy and, in, and very serious very serious. Lots of teach-ins going on, lots of invitations to come, welcoming of books and food. Very thrilling. You have, you've commented about also the kind of creativeness in the movement itself, which gives it a lot of new forms, of course. 
the crowd mic is only one of them. What are the other things which you find interesting in this kind of movement that has sprung up? With the General Assembly, the kind of participatory democracy, the ways in which voting and speaking for and against a, a series of choices takes place. Many elected officials were there, labor leaders, uh, Iraqi vets against the war, and there was maybe 800 people, 700 people. As it ended, they said, let's all march, and they passed out picket signs. We, it was evening last week. We marched down Michigan Avenue in Chicago, and we came upon the occupation, and we joined them. And they, the young people there, maybe 50 at that hour of night, kind of gave lessons to the hundreds of us that just joined them. This is where we are. This is what we do. This is how you say approval. This is how we vote. And they just did it very quickly. And then they resumed where they were about trying to make a decision about where they would occupy on Saturday night. So it was just welcoming and inclusive and open. And it's that quality of it that I think has sparked the ability to do it um, all over the country. I'll give you two other quick examples. There's a, not exactly an occupation, but a series of forces called Occupy the Hood. Great idea. So in the African-American community, they're bringing people to the south side and the west side of Chicago, doing educations, doing workshops and teach-ins, coming down there to talk to the occupiers. What a weird word. Same thing with the women's movement. They just started you know, women occupying and uh, to try to challenge some of the things that are going on that aren't perfect, but also to join it in a, in a wonderful spirit. So I think that kind of ability to um, expand and disagree, but not confront. And nobody knows really what to do and what's going to happen next. So there's a lot of regard for each other that's going on at this moment. It's very exciting. Of course, there's also the police moving in. I don't know if you saw the footage of Oakland a day ago, but, you know, 75 people were arrested. They're still in jail. One person, a Viet an Iraq vet, wounded gravely. Uh, you know, really police violence in the face of absolutely no violence coming from the occupiers. So it is... a uh, you know, it, it is what it is. It's a work in progress. Would you say, for instance, the impact of Cairo and Tunisia, for instance, on, on this movement in terms of nonviolence, the methods and so on? Enormous. Cannot be underestimated. It's very explicit that this group of people watched very closely during, particularly during the Cairo days, during the um, Egyptian days, and just like with Madison, Wisconsin, last spring, who had very explicit signs about Tahrir in the Midwest and, you know, were workers united, uh, there's a very clear sense, I think, of that kind of popular democracy and occupying a space. One of the things that was so clear from the, the rebellions in the Mideast from the Arab Spring was that notion that we can take a space and that that space can become a cultural center from which we develop and grow and move. An alternative vision, really. And I think at this stage of capitalism, when none of the problems, you know, oil, nuclear weapons, drones, expanding wars, no jobs here, uh, even for college graduates, enormous debts, foreclosures of houses, so, you know, I think that these, these, the sense that there's a system here, it comes with that. The sense that the system is brutally unfair, it comes with that. And how much it's going to be linked to empire, to this stage of capitalism, to the U.S. role in the world, well, we'll see. You know, that's the other question I was going to ask you, that it seems to have changed the discourse in the United States. But to what extent will it actually shift the politics to the left or, given the American uh, center today, actually shift the center from the right to at least the center as we know it to be? Who knows? That's the beauty of it. We don't know. It's, it's, um, I think it's, it's illuminating and a work in progress that 
must be nurtured and protected. And I'm I'm hoping that um, as it if it gets another month of traction, uh, or that these repressive measures will in fact increase the crowds that feel compelled to come out and join uh, and make themselves occupy. I think more and more students are moving there. I, I think, you know, the I was thinking about, do you remember the demand coming from the third world in the 80s of cancel the debt? Yeah. I think it's, you know, it's a, it's a human demand now. It's a global demand. It's outrageous that these young people owe hundreds of thousands of dollars to the banks by getting an education. It's completely insane, as it is as is foreign aid and the whole U.S. gambit around the world. So I think that this notion of what state power is, how capitalism is protecting itself as it weakens in the United States, um, you know, it's, what can I say? I think it goes to the heart of inequality, and that's what's exciting about this. People standing up is so exciting. Do you think it has immediate re repercussions on, for instance, President Obama's re-election? Do you think that it will actually make him shift some of his positions to at least more centrist, if not left, uh, positions within the Democratic Party? Uh, I, it's Certainly, I think the Democratic Party will try to absorb this energy. Um, what impact it will have on the president, who knows? All we can control is what we do, we the left, we the agitators. And I think that we, by, by pursuing what we see, how we analyze, what we know, and what the U.S. role in the world could be, 5% of the world's people, uh, controlling 50% of the world's wealth still, uh, you know, that's our challenge, right? Can we live differently? Can we regard the planet? Can we uh, recognize citizens across the board? Can we abolish the prisons? These are, you know, our huge challenges. And I think the fact that so much organizing work has been going on in all of these areas, and now it's exploding in this very explicit economic inequality mode, um, gives us a basis for uniting, but it's not given. It's not a given. And how it'll affect the corrupt, uh, you know, totally corrupted political party system, hard to know. Last time we had talked about, I think, quite some time back, it was about the fact that there is a right mobilization on the streets, Tea Party with guns and other things. But the left mobilization had really sort of hit the streets. So at the moment, we do see that there is a left mobilization as well. So this seems to be a very positive uh, issue as far as United States is concerned and the rest of the world, because unfortunately or fortunately, the United States is central to global capitalism. Yes, it is still, uh, even with its declining role, I would say, and it's certainly uh, critical to military power in the world which is a big arm, I think, of global capitalism at the moment. So, yeah, I think the uh, that sense of how you name your moment, this is what the young people, and not so young, are grappling with who have joined or feel allied with the Occupy movement. And I think nothing can be more uh, uh, significant as a breakthrough than to try to name the historical moment you're in and you know, push for equality and more democracy. And right now they're pretty good on those things. Could be better, uh, need to be more inclusive, uh, need to have a sharper analysis, of course. But that comes by throwing yourself, putting your body uh, on the line and, and, you know, on the wheel of history, as we say, yes. So you then get smarter, <laughs> quicker. <laughs> so for us, it's a big, is, it's a big laboratory for education. So for, for us of the '60s generation, this is really interesting times. Very exciting times. Yes, indeed. Thank you, Bernadine. I think this has been a great discussion, and we hope that you know that there is really some shift in the political balance in the United States through this movement. Thank you very much. <music>